why don't we get started? And a few folks will probably be joining us as we as we move through the through the agenda. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Adam Chapdelaine. I work as the town manager here in Arlington, and I have what hopefully will probably be the easiest job tonight in welcoming everybody uh, in setting the stage for what we're trying to accomplish tonight with this virtual forum. Uh, to we usually do this when we're in person to make sure we're in the right room, but we're all here tonight to talk about Connect Arlington, uh, Arlington's sustainable transportation plan. This is our virtual forum uh, to share with you the work that we've been doing, uh, but also more importantly to hear from you. Uh, as some of you may know, Arlington embarked on this plan uh, as really an, an offshoot for us to build off of Arlington's master plan. And we're looking forward to having an actionable plan that can achieve some of the following things. We wanna build off our past efforts, including our bus priority lanes along Mass Ave or our bus priority lane along Mass Ave, and continue our efforts to create multimodal streets or complete streets as they've become known uh, in recent years. We wanna balance thinking bold about the future of transportation and the options that would be required for bold thinking and making them work in Arlington while addressing localized transportation issues and challenges in our business districts and neighborhoods and at key intersections throughout the town. We wanna to consider Arlington in relation to the regional transportation network and try to figure out if there are ways we can ease transportation connections. And we wanna have a plan that creates an equitable strategy that can keep many modes of transportation in mind for a range of populations and ages that are represented in Arlington. So we look forward uh, to your participa uh, participation tonight we certainly look forward to coming up with this plan and beginning to implement it. Uh, and to get, dive into more detail, I'm going to turn it over to the Director of Planning and Community Development, Jenny Ray. Thank you, Adam. I'm Jenny Ray. I'm the Director of Planning and Community Development. Welcome, everybody, to tonight's forum. We're very excited to be hosting this forum. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about where we're heading tonight and what to expect, and also just sort of settle on some ground rules um, in terms of this Zoom format for the meeting. Most of us are familiar with it, of course, but I need to just let you know the details. Um, but first and foremost, I wanna thank um, both the town manager as well as the Sustainable Transportation Plan Advisory Committee. All of those uh, individuals are participating on this uh, in the forum tonight. Some of them will also be helping to facilitate breakout groups a little bit later. Um, those individuals include uh, a number of my staff, including Dan Amstutz, who's the Senior Transportation Planner, Heather Barber, um, Darcy De Devney, um, Len Diggins, Phil Goff, Doug Mayo-Wells, Mike Rademacher, Corey Rateau, Christine Shaw, Rachel Stark, and Ezekiel Wheeler. Um, and they don't all work on the Department of Planning and Community Development staff. Didn't mean to make it sound that way. Um, everybody is representing different facets of the community. But I also wanna thank other staff who are participating, including Kelly Lanema, um, Julie Wayman from the town manager's office. Um, Ali Carter is also uh, participating as well. So uh, this evening, Dan, if you could forward the slide, please. I'm just gonna run through the Zoom meeting guidelines and format. Then I'm gonna give you an overview of Connect Arlington, which is what we're calling the Sustainable Transportation Plan. We're gonna have a pause for Q&A and then we're gonna break out into little groups um, and report back and have some uh, learnings from all of those small groups, as well as continued discussion, and then we'll adjourn for the evening. Next slide, please. So um, by default, everybody is going to be muted for this uh, conversation, mostly until we get to the Q&A. Um, there will be some opportunities for people to, to share their questions with us, but participants are not able to share their screen, so you might have seen that option in other meetings. We're not doing that tonight. The only individual sharing their screen will be Dan um, during the presentation. And then when you go into the breakout room, your facilitator will share their screen. The chat function is enabled for those questions and chats are gonna come to the hosts, which is basically everybody on the committee. The meeting is being recorded as you may have seen and will be also posted to the town's website by early the following week. Um, so sometime next week for additional participation after the meeting and for, of course, for those who were unable to attend. Participants are able to raise their hand via Zoom to ask a question, um, and that would happen specifically during our two times that we have open Q&A, um, and they'll be called upon uh, in order that we see the hands raised. Town staff are gonna help to unmute you, and then we'll call on you to speak. 
Um, if you're not familiar with how Zoom works, I'm going to just quickly um, orient folks. So mute and unmute buttons are in the lower left hand corner of the Zoom screen. For if you're wondering where that raise hand feature is, if you go to the list of participants, there's a little uh, two little icons with people. Click on that and the raise hand feature is on the lower right under the list of participants. For people who are calling in by phone, if there are any now or in the future, you use star nine to control the mute and unmute and star six to raise your hand. And of course, it's preferred if everybody turns off their video during the Q&A and also during the breakout groups, so it's more like a conversation. But of course, it's not required. Um, it's also not required if you, if you don't wish to participate in those small groups. I do hope that you can participate this evening. Please, um, to the next slide. So Connect Arlington started with, uh, as Adam had already said, but just to give you a sense of where we're heading, we're, we're looking to jump off of what we have in our existing master plan, which is a, a section called traffic and circulation. Um, and of course, a number of existing town policies which speak to complete streets, traffic rules and regulations, and many other orders that relate to how we control traffic and circulation in town. There are many other entities that participate in that process, including committees like Transportation Advisory Committee and the Arlington Bicycle Advisory Committee. And we rely upon all of that, but we wanna build upon that excellent work and develop a 20-year vision, which looks forward into the future, um, builds off of that existing system, incorporates new technologies and other in innovations, and is incredibly focused on an equitable system. It will lead us to have better and improved priorities and recommendations for everything from projects, programs, and of course, new policies that can help us to change things in the future, hopefully. It will cover all aspects of transportation. So while you might individually want to speak to uh, your interest in walking or biking, public transit, we're gonna be talking about all different modes, including micro mobility. Next slide, please. So we've hired Nelson Nygaard as the lead consultant on the project after a process of uh, conducting a request for proposals and interviewing four different firms um, who uh, were able to submit proposals. This was pre-pandemic pre um, interviews and uh, with participation of members of the Sustainable Transportation Plan um, Advisory Committee, as well as Dan Amstutz. We selected Nelson Nygaard as the lead because of their expertise and background in transportation planning, particularly long range planning, but also their capacity to handle innovative planning um, and looking at carefully at existing conditions to really drive us into the future. And for engagement and outreach, of course, that has shifted a bit due to the pandemic. Um, but the first of those tasks has been, you know, really a lot of research, which we're gonna share with you this evening, including the development of what we're calling a transportation fact book, and also uh, the survey, which some of you may have already participated in. We're gonna share some of those results this evening. And of course, developing an engagement strategy, which we've redeveloped a couple of times, and now we're having an, a, a virtual meeting. Uh, but we've also done a couple of other things, including, I mentioned the survey. We also, also have had some uh, individual engagement, um, working with the Council on Aging and other groups, as well as um, focus groups, focused on some key transportation that you're going to hear a lot about a little bit later, um, as well as an online input map, which a lot of people has, have participated in. And we're, going, we're planning to likely have another forum as well. And so with that, I'm actually going to turn it over to Dan, who's going to give us a presentation about the transportation facts and existing conditions, and also the survey. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Um, hi, my name is Daniel Amstutz. I'm the Senior Transportation Planner with the Town of Arlington. And in this part of the presentation, I'm going to talk, as Jenny mentioned, about what we've learned so far, um, working on the existing conditions and working towards the Transportation Fact Book, which is essentially going to be a document that's going to have lots of maps and charts and graphs and cover things like demographics and the transportation system walking and biking and uh, transportation and transit, different things such as that. And this is going to be highlights from that. There's actually a much larger presentation that's posted to the calendar item on the town's website for this forum. And that has much more information about it. I'm just going to go uh, a few slides into some of the more interesting findings from that fact book. So one of the 
findings or one of the very interesting pieces as you look at things like, in this case, zoning compared to a transit and your transportation system, we see how geography really influences the land use, which influences transportation choice. So you can see here that the multifamily um, is centered around Mass Ave and also around the east part of uh, town in East Darlington. And so, and the flatter areas tend to have this higher density and commercial activity. But as you move further away from Mass Ave to the north and south and into the west part of town and the heights, the hillier areas tend to be more single family in character. Uh, the transit corridors and transportation corridors are centered also more in the middle in the valley part of the town where you've got not only Mass Ave, but you also have the Minuteman Bikeway, which is on a former rail right-of-way. And this is very interesting to see how some of these denser areas have clustered around the, uh, the valley area where the, um, more of the, the transportation, the public transportation is centered. And sort of going along with that, uh, one thing that the Nelson Nygaard has looked at is also the topography and how it shapes Arlington's transportation. As you can see, again, the, the dark red lines that are on this map show streets that have very high slopes that are very steep. And you can see that in the east part of town, there isn't very much, but as you get you know, further to the west, you have many streets that have very, very steep slopes. And, and so you can see how the, the higher density housing and commercial areas is closer into those flatter areas. And you can see how difficult it can be, even if somebody uh, is close to an amenity that maybe they could walk or bike to, um, it doesn't seem quite as close when they have to go down a very steep road or hill and due to a mobility issue or health issue, they simply can't do that. So that inf influences how they decide how to get around. We've also been looking at the traffic volumes that are um, the historic traffic volumes so that we understand sort of the flow of traffic around the town. This is, a, is something that hasn't really been updated for a little while. And this, this uh, covers a sort of usual street topology that we have in transportation planning, where in the white lines, you have the local streets that channel drivers to the collectors, like Summer Street and Park Street, which bring people to the major arterials like Mass Ave, Medford, Pleasant, and Mystic Street, and they lead you to the large uh, uh, controlled access highways like Route 2, uh, which if you go west, you can go I-95, Route 128. If you go east, you can go towards Cambridge into Alewife Brook Parkway. And so this is important, you know, very, very uh, common transportation item that we look at is these volumes. These are estimated volumes. Uh, we have a bit more specifics within the fact book. Um, oops, excuse me. And we also look at safety. We look at traffic collisions that have happened around town. In this case, we're looking between January 2016 and April 2020. Almost 2,000 crashes were recorded at this time from Massachusetts Department of Transportation data. I will also point out that this includes um, the only two fatalities within the last uh, few years that we've looked at so far are the pedestrian fatality on Chestnut Street at Chestnut Terrace and the bicycle fatality at Mass Ave and Appleton. Uh, the bicycle fatality is actually a little bit outside of this. It happened in May, but we've included it as part of the analysis too. And we also hope to look further back in the timeline to actually look at some of the uh, earlier fatalities to see if we can understand a trend. One of the unusual things about this map, you can see that most of the, the crashes are along the main corridors like Mass Ave and Mystic Street and Broadway, but there's also a lot of crashes that are dispersed throughout the neighborhoods. And so uh, Beta Group, which is a subconsultant to Nelson Nygaard, is looking much further uh, deeper into this to understand what types of crashes these are and why they happened. Commuting patterns is another piece of this to understand how people are getting around and how this affects transportation in town. Uh, as you can see, there is a high density of people that are um, that are working in East Cambridge or Harvard Square, uh, downtown Boston, the Back Bay in the, in the darker red areas, and also within Arlington. But actually almost 50% of uh, commuters that, that live in Arlington and commute somewhere else, uh, they will work in Burlington or Waltham or Watertown and other places that are a little bit more difficult to access by transit or, or other means other than driving. And then along those lines, again, where do the commuters live? This goes back to the first couple of 
maps that we showed, many of the, or the, the non-driving commuters, again, living a lot in the, the higher density areas and closer to Mass Ave and closer to those, um, the, you know, high speed or, or high frequency public transportation networks along Mass Ave, Route, Route 77 um, in particular. And so you can see again, how the geography really affects and the street network really affects how people uh, get around. So in this part of the pr presentation, I'm going to go through um, briefly just some highlights from the transportation survey and input they received uh, from the transportation feedback map. This was a piece of the survey. If you went to the very end of it, you could get to this map and you could drop a point at a location anywhere on this map and point out a safety issue or a concern. And over more than 200 points were dropped on here. And so we're gonna analyze this and see um, where all of the, the points were dropped and what kind of issues were brought up. Uh, we'll talk about this a little bit more in the breakout groups, but as you can see, the, uh, we had a question on the survey about the goals for Arlington's transportation system. And the highest priority that came out of this was, was considering the needs of diverse populations and people of all ages, uh, prioritizing a walk-friendly environment, uh, focusing on transit in sort of two different goals, and then prioritizing safety for all, no matter how they travel. And so we want to have a conversation during the breakout groups to understand if um, you feel these are uh, really the most important goals that we should be focusing on as we develop the rest of the plan. Although we asked questions about uh, transportation commuting within the, uh, how you commute within the survey, we also have looked at census data. This is from 2018 about how people travel in Arlington, but compared to several other communities. And Arlington actually stacks up very well in terms of having a very diverse range of uh, different ways that people get to work. As you can see, 60% drive alone, but 20% use public transportation, despite the fact that we don't have a MBTA uh, station or a commuter rail station within the town's borders. So, um, you know, the importance, you can see the importance of having the T station nearby, but also the bus system that we have throughout town. The other interesting point is that we have the highest mode share of bicycle commuting out of all of the communities that are on this list, 4%, which doesn't seem like a lot, but it's again, higher than the other communities. So we already have a very robust, diverse modal share in our system. A few other of the results from the questions that we had, respondents, they mostly drive or walk for non-commute trips. Um, most currently drive or walk to, to get to school, run errands or to do uh, socialization, uh, socializing trips. Um, they also have the largest share of rideshare trips, uh, the socializing trips, and transit is not used as much of the non-commute travel, but for those, it is used for mostly for social extracurriculars. As you can see, um, this is the responses from the survey. Um, another one was, another question we had was, if you were to change your travel habits, how would you most prefer to get around Arlington and the region? And interestingly, um, bicycling to work was the most preferred mode um, or, or preferred what people would like to change to. And overall, people would like to bike or walk more, but would still maintain driving trips for errands and socializing. And there's more information about the survey in the larger stack of slides um, that's on the town's website, as I mentioned earlier. So in the last couple of slides, I'm just going to talk about what's coming up here and the next steps for this project. So <laughs> when it comes to developing the plan, we want to understand what kind of strategies that we're going to need to utilize in order to get to the goals of the plan. What is it that the town can do independently? When and which partner partners would be needed for larger projects? And what may be sort of seem out of the town's control, such as uh, regional roadway congestion? Um, how, you know, how can we help with that, uh, but understanding that it would be more of a regional uh, approach and not just the town can do it. So where we're seeing where we are today in the existing conditions, looking at the short-term improvements we can, we can make, developing partnerships where we need to, for example, with the MBTA when it comes to uh, transit service, and understand for those major and networked investments that are much larger, um, larger pieces where we need to work with many more partners, you know, how we, we get that into the plan so that we can continue to move it forward and keep it you know, sustainable in the sense that we want to be able to keep um, this plan going and not leave it on a, sh on a shelf somewhere where we won't, you know, we will forget about it. Um, part of this includes a roadmap for tracking progress. This picture is from the city of Newton's transportation plan. And this gives you an idea of how we want to have measures and uh, showing what the baseline is today and then what target we want to reach so that we can look at this every year and say, are we starting to reach that target? Um, if a modal, uh, 
we want a greater modal share, for example. So you can see there's a, um, a proposal for, you know, diversifying the mode share in Newton so that there's only about 50% driving and, you know, 23% transit. So it's that kind of idea of getting, setting that target and, and working on reaching that target. And then finally, this is the timeline about where we are. So you can see we're here. The public meeting you see on there is this virtual forum. We had planned to have a couple more before this and some mobile workshops, but you know, due to the coronavirus and the restrictions on in-person meetings, we unfortunately could not hold those. The ones that we are showing for later on, those are to be determined right now. Uh, but you can see our existing conditions analysis and the fact book should be, uh, we should be able to release that in the next couple of weeks. We've had several committee meetings. Uh, so continuing the public engagement with our committee, having this, this survey that I talked about, the online focus groups that we had a couple months ago, and then we're having a, a few more next week. Um, and again, trying to continue the public engagement and hoping to finish up this plan by the end of the year, by the end of December is, is what we are, our goal is. And that is why all I have. Um, so at this point, we're at the Q&A period. So um, if you would like to ask a question um, that uh, staff can answer, you can raise your hand. And uh, I think Kelly is actually going to identify people and uh, call on them to speak. Sorry, uh, Joanne Kleiss has your hand raised. Joanne, I'm going to unmute you. Uh, oh, it looks like you're already unmuted. Go yeah, ahead. Yeah, I am. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Um, I don't have a car, and I walk and take the 77 bus. But during the school year, the bus, the, the MBTA also seems to become the school bus. So like, meaning that so many students are taking the bus. So there's a whole period in the afternoon where it's actually very hard to get on the bus um, because it's just picking up and dropping off students. And there could be an hour and a half interval where it's hard for other people to use the bus. Is, are people aware of this in transportation planning and how can that be fixed? Of course, now in the time of COVID, I'm not sure um, <clears throat> how many students will be on the buses. But this is really like an hour and a half. You almost have to plan to try to get on the bus before or after this period when all the students descend on it. Sure, thank you very much for that question. Um, I believe that the T does do some extra runs of buses in order to um, accommodate some of the students and actually make some extra or stops they, that they wouldn't normally make. But I think that um, this, I think some of it runs down to sort of a frequency issue of the T being able to run enough buses for all of the, the demand for the service. Um, so this is a frequent question that comes up about, well, can we get the 77 you know, to have more frequency or the 79? Um, and it is sort of a complicated issue. And that's, this is something that we need to work with the, the MBTA on to figure out what's the best solution. Um, but, but yeah, I think that, is, um, that isn't something that I've specifically heard about. I've certainly seen the kids getting off the bus, for example, at Audison in the morning. And you know, they, it seems like they probably run an extra bus to do that. But that, um, that's a very good point that, that may make it difficult for other people that are um, trying to use the bus for everyday trips in order to use uh, the bus at that time. Thank you. It looks like David Watson was next. Hi, uh, I was looking at uh, at your data on both um, the priorities that that people uh, that people set, and found that it was somewhat interesting that bike infrastructure didn't really make the cut for the the top level of priority interests, but by commuting is of the highest interest um, for people who want a mode shift. So um, 
do you want to, can you talk about that a little bit more? Um, you know, why is it that people are not as interested in bike infrastructure when they're very interested in biking? Hi, David. Thanks for that question. Um, I think that, I mean, if you look at some of the the goals, they, things like safety for all, you know, no matter how they travel, I think that is very relevant to people bicycling, um, as opposed to sort of a very specific goal of putting in more, um, you know, protected bicycle facilities, for example. So I feel like the goals that people um, that people voted to be higher um, can actually cover things like bicycling because they're a little bit more broad based as opposed to being very specific to one particular mode. Um, so I think that that may be just the the way that the sort of the questions were set up with with the different types of goals. But it seems like people gravitated more towards those more broad based goals that um, can can more sort of change the way that we look at how we design the transportation system as opposed to focusing in on um, one particular but i do but i also I also see that so the pedestrian side of it was very high too, and I think certainly through uh, talking with the public a number of times, the walking and pedestrianism is also extremely important to people. Looks okay. Like, uh, uh, oh, I, I mean, was it? I I, I appreciate it. Uh, I don't remember the survey, but you know, I, I can see uh, bike infrastructure being consumed, uh, subsumed uh, under safety for all road users. So I'll I'll let it go. <laughs> I I will say also that that was actually I think I think there were ten up there, and that was sixth out of the list. So it came in um, towards the middle, but I think that just because it's not like on the very top of the list doesn't mean that we wouldn't, uh, um, bicycling would still be an important piece of the system and clearly through the mode shares and how people wanting to be able to bike that comes out. Um, but uh, I can understand that biking infrastructure can also be uh, controversial. So, so um, you know, for a, for a larger set survey like this, um, you know, I can understand that it may not necessarily rise to the top, but that doesn't mean that it wouldn't be part of our strategy. I just want to yeah. quickly, sorry, oh, Kelly, yeah. <laughs> one, one more minute. I, I see the hand raised. Um, just for, uh, if you for, feel as though this is actually the conversation in the breakout groups, but if you feel as though there needs to be greater emphasis on, for example, bike infrastructure or um, capacity on MBTA buses or something else that you think wasn't well reflected in the survey results, that's the sort of thing we want to hear more from you about. And we'll be talking about that a little bit more in the breakout group. So um, feel free to raise this issue again, David, and also Joanne. Great. And we have Julie Sussman, and then we have um, two write-in questions after that. Okay, this is actually not for you. I just wanted to second the first speaker who mentioned the kids on the bus. Um, my bus stop where I get on, whenever I say what I do, I mean pre-COVID. I haven't been on a bus since March. But I tend to go down to the bus stop nearest my house, which is directly opposite the high school. And I don't usually remember the plan. I'm just going into Boston or Cambridge and I go there and I say, oh no, I forgot it's 2.30. I'm in trouble. I'm going to be so late because at 2.30 the bus is fill up, bus after bus, and you pretty much can't expect to get anywhere. That's all. Just a second what she said. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, one other thing that I will say is that um, I mean, it is good that we we do have the bus system and the the you know kids were able to use it. Um, arguably, you know, if those if they were being sort of driven everywhere, then that would increase the traffic congestion around the schools at those times as well. So there's sort of there's a balancing act to be made um, that it does provide this this very good service for the kids. But yes, that is a oh, certainly sure. a concern when it happens all at once. Certainly wonderful to to transport the kids that way. There isn't a better way. 
I'm just saying they really need ex more extra surface if they're going to transport anybody else. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so in the chat, Keith Jensen, Jensen asks, um, he says, I support alternatives to cars, including biking, walking, etc. I have a question about why some roads have spots without painted lines, specifically on Mass Ave near the main fire station. I've noticed that lines will be painted east and west at various times, but are we skipping this area? Many other roads also need line painting frequently due to high traffic. Um, I think the lines really help keep people in their lanes, improving safety and traffic flow. So I guess just a question about why um, why there's intermittent painting on the roads. So let me speak first to the one about Mass Ave and by the fire station. So that part of that roadway was going to be part of Mass Ave Phase Two um, for for rehabilitating the roadway. Uh, putting in bicycle lanes, also um, doing some work around Broadway Plaza. And unfortunately, the um, some of the grant programs, because it would be a very expensive project, we were looking for um, federal or state grants for that. But unfortunately, those uh, we weren't able to do those. And so we started doing some uh, sort of pieces of the, that project, which include there's um, sidewalk work that's happening in Arlington Center right now around um, uh, specifically between um, Pleasant Street and Mystic Street over to uh, Franklin Street, um, which was originally part of phase two. Um, and we're replacing other things like the lighting and so on. And <clears throat> the roadway is definitely a concern. It's in really bad shape. And um, I think that there is some, um, that would be more of a question for public works to win that would be repaved, but that is um, something that we to work on for putting in bike facilities. It's um, challenging with the uh, number of vehicles that go through that area and also the median as well as the on-street parking. So I would say that some, it's sort of not, not as straightforward as just painting lines often. And it's often we need to, um, in order to get the proper width and the spacing from a travel lane, if we want to put in a bike lane, for example, um, that may affect on-street parking. And so that is something that we need to address um, in order to provide the space for uh, drivers or, or for MPT buses along with cyclists if we were going to make like a separated facility. Um, and generally that you need to kind of look at that on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, um, I see Jennifer Sauce has her hand raised. Hi, yeah. Um, I wanted to actually um, sort of talk again about the students on the bus. And, um, and it's something I've been talking about for many years and getting nowhere with. If you are a family that lives towards the center in East Arlington and you want to put your kid on the bus, there's maybe a 50% chance that your kid will get on the bus. And so many, many, many parents drive their kids to school who do not want to drive their kids to school. They would much, much, much prefer that their kids are on the bus. And of course, the problem is that we are, we don't have control over the MTVA. I mean, we, you know, so we could say, let's put some more buses on it, but we just don't have control over them. But I, it's, a, it's a serious issue in town that's creating much more traffic in the mornings than needs to be, because there are just tons and tons of parents who would be very, very happy with their kids on a bus, but they know their kids are going to be late half the time. Thank you. Yeah, I, I mean, to be honest, I don't have uh, an answer for that. Um, this is actually, I, I'm aware, again, that like the middle school and uh, high school kids, uh, children will ride the bus, but um, I had actually heard that it was so uh, challenging for people that are just trying to, you know, ride to work or ride to the grocery store or something. We're also having a problem getting on there. So um, it's just definitely something we can raise with the MBTA. Um, I mean, yes, right now um, the the public transportation system is going to be very constricted due to the um, the challenges of dealing with COVID nineteen. This has been uh, sort of a a theme over the last several months with public transportation is to how to 
have people ride without uh, safely. Um, you know, what it's, so they're already going to have some limitations on the number of people that can put it, that can ride in the bus. But um, that's certainly something we need to raise with them to see if they can um, either do something about the scheduling or um, again, increasing frequency is challenging to, to the sort of limitations on the number of buses and the number of drivers that they have. But um, this is, is definitely something we'll want to raise with them. Thank you. And then we just have, we have one more comment in the chat and I think we can probably go to um, our breakout groups, um, but just a question about how the plan is um, going to address any increases in population throughout town. So if there are zoning changes or if there are new developments in town, um, given that the plan is for many years into the future, um, how are we working and thinking ahead? So, Jenny, do you mind taking this? <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> um, well, first I want to say that's a great, that's an excellent question because we just shared with you a lot of existing conditions. The whole part of actually the, the next part of the process is really the look ahead and who do we want to be and what kind of transportation, transportation system do we need to build, which also relates to some of the development patterns that we might be seeing or things that might change. I don't think, however, things will change dramatically per se over the time period that we're looking at such that we would need to make significant transportation changes. I think what we're trying to look at is a sustainable transportation system that provides a lot of options for people, even more options than they have now, and makes it easier for people to use those options to get around town, to move around. So that's not necessarily to accommodate growth, but it could be because it's adding to, instead of increasing roadway volume um, only for cars, it's also looking at other options and other modes, which is what we think is the best way for us to plan for the future with the limited capacity that we have to, ex we don't have the capacity to expand roadways um, or build new roads in Arlington. So we have to work with what we have in the best way that we can, but also be planful of the new technologies that will be coming and that are already happening and incorporate those and even use our roadways even better to accommodate different types of, of growth as well as different types of modes and the mode shift of the future. So I know that's, a, that's not a, a specific answer maybe as much as you would want, but I think as we get into the next phase, we're, we're gonna continue to get more feedback about where we're going as a town and, and the community in general in relation to, to transportation. And then when we probably have our next forum, we'll have a, a preview of what those types of policies and projects and programs might look like, which I think will drill down a little bit more and answer some of this kind of question. So I think actually we're right at time. And if you would go to the next slide, what we're gonna do, unless, sorry, Kelly, was there weren't any other questions. Okay. So what we're gonna do now is uh, move into breakout groups. Um, so if you could move to the next slide, I'm just gonna, give you a quick preview. You're gonna answer some questions in your groups. Each group is assigned both a facilitator and a note taker. And um, we have five groups. Yes, <laughs> um, five groups. I believe it's about seven to eight people per group. And uh, one person, as I said, will be facilitating so that they can focus on the conversation and hopefully everybody can help to answer some of these discussion prompts. And this is really, again, to get you talking and thinking about um, what, you, what you heard and also some of your you know, dreams and visions for the future. That's the magic wand question. Um, and then also a little bit of input on what you think might be getting in the way of making some changes for the future. What would be in the way of making things happen? Um, the note takers are actually going to be writing everything up. Um, you might even see what they're writing. Um, that'll be reported out as we come back and rejoin this bigger group so that you have an opportunity to hear the types of conversations that were happening in those other groups. And also so that we can then wrap up and conclude with some next steps. Um, I think there's also a brief period where we might have some opportunity for additional uh, Q&A before we part ways. So with that, um, you're actually going to have 30 minutes in your breakout groups um, and there will be a five minute warning. So with that, I'm gonna have Kelly start to assign the groups.
Okay, so we're going to start um, sending you into breakout groups. You'll see a pop up on your screen. Um, just go ahead and click OK. You don't have to choice join the breakout group if you want to hang out in the main room, but um, we do encourage you to participate in this discussion. So I'm going to send everyone out. Hey, Darcy. <clears throat> Thanks for taking the notes. Anytime. <laughs> I'd so much rather do that than facilitate. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Jennifer. Hello. Hi, Allie. And hey, Sean. Allie. Sean, do you want to turn on your video? It's totally up to you. You don't have to. But during this kind of quick intro, intro phase, if you want. Um, but and and I think it's fine. It's a small enough group. We'll probably get one or two more. I'm guessing, um, but we could all probably just be unmuted. It, it, um, I think that probably works out. <clears throat> and Jennifer, one of the things I wanted to respond, but um, wasn't my job necessarily to respond to the whole group about your question. And I'm, and I know you know this, but I think um, I'll say it. And it's too bad not everyone heard it. Is cl clearly the improvements that connect the new AHS with the Minuteman path will make it, you know, just a bit easier for the students who are closer to the center who aren't so far east in East Arlington to probably encourage a handful more to, to bike or to walk the school as well. So well, let's hope that that's one partial solution to the bus crowding problem for the students in East Arlington for sure. Right, but some of that stuff is, some of that stuff has been taken out in the project, right? Yeah. No, I know. Off saving, so. Yeah. 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 And that's why it's important to hear from people in meetings like this that the, how important <laughs> that connection is. I have to say, yeah. I, I, I do think that kids often like taking the bus because it gives them options after school. Yep. They don't have a bike to deal with, right? So biking is great, but then you have to deal with the bike later yep. on. Yep. So. Yep, agreed. So um, I guess this is our group and um, I'll introduce myself. I'm Phil Goff. I am on the, um, uh, the advisory committee that the town set up for the uh, sustainable transportation plan. I live on Grafton Street in East Arlington. I'm the, the co-chair of uh, East Arlington Liberal Streets Coalition as well. So I'm kind of a neighborhood transportation advocate and I'm a professional transportation planner as well. So I'll announce the names. We'll go around the horn here, do a quick, quick intro. 30 seconds to 45 seconds is probably fine. And then we'll move into the question. So first, uh, Darcy, our note taker. Hi, um, I'm Darcy Devney. I'm on the Arlington Disability Commission, which is why I'm on the transportation advisory uh, plan. I also live in East Arlington, um, a long time uh, East Arlington, but I don't, I can't bicycle. So I don't know very much about that part. I'm learning some of it. Uh, because of the stuff I'm reading in this committee. Great, Jennifer. Hi, I'm Jennifer Seuss. I am um, used to be a school committee member. I'm not anymore. Um, I'm interested in uh, transportation and housing and the interconnection between the two of them um, and East Arlington resident. Okay, great. Well, thanks for joining, Allie. Hey, I'm Allie Carter. I'm the Economic Development Coordinator for the town. Uh, I do not live in Arlington. I commute to Arlington. <laughs> well, again, someday I will, <laughs> and I have in the past. Yeah. Um, so I guess for my participation today, I'll actually try and focus on things I hear from business owners, um, if that helps contribute to the sharing and conversation. Yeah, that's great. And Sean, um, I hope you can hear me. I haven't heard your voice yet, but I'm hoping that your mic works and you're able to introduce yourself. Let's see if I can maybe, oh, if I can unmute him. Oh, you're unmuted now, Sean. Oh, now he's muted. Um, Sean is from ACMI, so he might just oh. be here to record. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> but he also works in Arlington and maybe <laughs> even lives here. Uh, okay. All Jump right. Well, anytime you want, Sean. Okay. Well, we have a very small group. I don't know if um, 
I assume that they were distributing the those who wanted to join a breakout group somewhat equally. So what this says to me is probably a handful of people decided they just wanted to see the presentation, maybe, and then that's it. Or perhaps a handful of people didn't want to be in a small group and just are waiting to hear back from the larger group. So um, we've got, I guess, 25 minutes or 20 minutes, then we're going to get a five minute warning. When we get that five minute warning, we can decide to finish up or, or continue on a little bit, um, or we could just join back in, in with the larger group. And Darcy, as the note taker, um, is going to take wonderful notes and then provide a little bit of a summary of our discussion here uh, in the report back to the larger group. So I will uh, share screen now so you can see, <coughs> excuse me, so you can see the breakout group questions. Is everyone seeing the, the slide with the questions? Yes, okay. Thank you, Ali. So I guess, uh, you know, in, initially what we want to do is kind of start a little bit more broad, high level and hear from some folks about just, you know, generally um, what some of the uh, key goals for the sustainable transportation plan are. And if you are supportive uh, of the five that really scored the highest, at least in the survey. And, the, you know, the survey is really only to inform ultimately decisions about um, which are the final goals for the plan, but this is where we're at right now and we're, we want to hear from people to see if maybe something was missed or if something should be tweaked or um, we've already heard a comment that maybe bikes should be included in the five more explicitly. Um, does anyone have any thoughts about the goals? That mean, oh, Jennifer, yeah, go ahead. Just jump in. We're such okay. a small group. I didn't know. Um, so, uh, you know, I think there are some really tiny things that could make things a lot easier <laughs> um, in bike infrastructure. And I've always been struck that there isn't um, adequate bike um, racks, especially in key places, like yeah. in front of a post office, in front of a bank, right? That's the kind of things that you need. There's a quick and easy right there in front of it to have a bike. A rack, a small bike rack. Yeah. Um, and so I know that the town did do, you know, put some in at some point, but it seems like they sort of then stopped and didn't sort of take it to the next step and do a reanalysis of where it was needed. So I, I'd love to see that happen. <coughs> yeah, that's great. There was a, um, a few years ago, there was a regional, excuse my cough here, everybody. There was a regional program that MAPC um, which is regional planning agency sponsored where they actually funded, I think 100% uh, of bike racks for towns and cities up to a certain number of racks. And Arlington, of course, took advantage of that, installed, I don't know, I'm guessing maybe 50 or 60 racks uh, four or five years ago. And I know Darcy and I worked on uh, locating them in East Arlington at the time. Um, and I think that the town, it's a great comment for us to record to show that that's important to people because I think the town and town meeting, finance committee, et cetera, I don't think there's been money to, to build more bike racks, install more bike racks in different parts of town. I think we relied just on what we got in essence for free from MAPC. So that's a great- I have to say that the major places I would want a bike rack, there isn't anyone. So my local bank in East Arlington, my local post office in East Arlington, yep. and my gym in the center. And you know, obviously I'm not going to the gym or anything, but you know, yeah, yeah. Sure. <laughs> uh, but those are the three places that I would, that I would use a bike rack all the time. Yeah. Right. And so they, there just aren't any, and I have to you know, yeah. find a tree and stuff like that. It's just yeah. harder. And to me, an example, a good example of if, you know, if you build it, you know, they will come, people will use it is the increasing number of bike racks in front of kickstand cafe, mm -hmm. which, you know, five years ago, there was just, you know, there was a, a small rack, on their property and a couple of bike racks at the Minuteman. Now they've taken over, you know, one of the parking spaces of bike racks, they put more in the front and those things on nice days really, really fill up. So I think that's great. Um, Jennifer, you'd mentioned sort of small infrastructure improvements and bike racks obviously are a key one there. Are there some little like missing links? Oh gee, if we only had a bike lane on this, this, this block or two that you've also noticed or is more about the parking? Well, I mean, I'm sure everyone knows that the center is a mess. I mean, there's, 
and we have yes. to, you know, I know that we're waiting, we want to keep going for the for state and federal money for that. Um, but that feels like a very, as, as you know, very dangerous yeah. section. It's very unfun to bike on because it's, there's just so many potholes. So that is definitely a missing link in Arlington for right now. Yep. And um, Ali, have you heard much about either bike parking or maybe, you know, continuity of bike infrastructure in the center? Have you ever heard from any businesses about that being important to them? Clearly the kickstand cafe, it's a big, big thing, but I'm not sure if you've heard from others. Yeah, I, I do hear it occasionally. And what what actually frustrates me is that um, it would be nice if we had some sort of like inventory of bike racks or some, not inventory of what's there, but actual like a physical inventory that was available. Um, you know, there's not a lot of storage space at DPW, but having said that, some occasionally someone will request a bike rack in front of their business and then it's like, oh, it's going to take like, you know, three months to order one. And it, it just seems like something that we should be able to be a little bit more responsive for and even just have like some, some of those lollipop style ones just around. Um, or even, I know they're not perfect, but like some movable ones, you know, temporary ones that um, can be put in place just yeah. as there's demand. Yep. Yeah, terrific. And I think that, you know, some of you perhaps have heard that there will be the expansion of the bike share system to the town sometime in the next couple months. And let's hope that um, with correctly placed stations that businesses will start really appreciating people coming from Alewife and Cambridge and Somerville and biking, being able to bike into the center, park their blue bikes and uh, partake in the businesses after all of them fully open, of course. <laughs> So, okay, any other comments from anyone related to the, to the goals? And Jennifer, were you implying that one of the five should be about bike infrastructure or you were just making that comment about sort of general bike infrastructure? My comment is that it's, it's a relatively cheap thing to do, right? So it's, it's yeah. just not that, you know, it would make a difference um, and it's relatively cheap. And actually I do think there's, there is, potentially issues around putting bike um, racks near where there's a uh, handicap parking, right? Mm -hmm. so some of those places that I would love to see a bike rack, there's also handicap parking and you obviously can't, yeah. you know, you can't interfere with the, <laughs> those things. And so you have to be, you have to think carefully about where to put it. Yeah. Uh, it may not be right in front, maybe it's a little bit down or something. That's actually one of those like hidden things that's always more complicated than it seems to be about placing a bike rack is that you have to make sure it's in an accessible location. And so people are like, it's a bike rack. What's the big deal? And it's like, it's actually nothing on any public right of way is ever just a thing. It's always a big deal. Um, you can't interfere with anybody with, with the access that somebody is using to a parking exactly. Place, right? But exactly. I agree that we could have sort of perhaps a set of best practices of like just general kind of like areas where they should can and cannot go. Mm -hmm. Um pretty yeah, the post office feels so obvious to me. You know, you're going there with like a few letters, you know, you know, like you can oh, just post Yeah, post mm -hmm. office really feels yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Phil and I did uh work on on placing bike racks and handicap parking spaces and working that all out when we were putting in a bunch of handicapped parking spaces at once. Um, so it is something, but Allie's really right. There are so many little things you have to think about and so much street furniture. Mm -hmm. You know, in East Arlington, the sidewalks are so cluttered <laughs> that it's very hard to get the space for a bike rack without running into accessibility problems with the width and nowadays we want an even bigger sidewalk for the you know dine in dine dine outside stuff mm -hmm. um so it, it is an issue but she's she's right maybe we could try temporary ones mm -hmm. and then if you could move them around where people wanted them because mm -hmm. the the new blue bikes are going to have docks right they're they're ones where they are putting a station yeah. but i don't know how movable a station is once they put it down <laughs> uh, it can be moved. Uh, it, it, you need a crane, but they can be moved. 
it's a big deal yeah the, the good news the good news is we won't have line bikes which on some occasions we're kind of parked in the middle of sidewalks and in other funny places and line bike for you know uh, for good and for bad is gone so there's nothing to even say about it anymore um, and the blue bikes uh, certainly those stations take up more space they'll be on the smaller side versus the typical stations you might see say at Davis Square or um, in Alewife at Alewife station where you have real big stations ours will be you know a little you know, uh, little mini me sizes with uh, with seven or eight bikes and I think maybe 10 racks rather than the, you know, 19s and maybe 50 racks that you see on the bigger, bigger stations. So um, they take up some space for sure. But of course, obviously ADA issues will always be looked at. Some may be in the street to replace uh, on street parking um, uh, and others will be on sidewalks. That'll be fine. <laughs> Yeah, in some cases that may work out. That may work out fine, where you just don't have space. Like in Capitol Square, I'm not sure with bus stops and street furniture and handicapped spaces. You know, and the the one in Capitol Square, my guess is it's going to need to replace one parking spot. Um, but but I'm not sure. Town isn't there yet. I think in terms of the specific. I think you could go and replace some of the Grafton Street parking spaces. You know, we have right at Mass Ave and Grafton yeah. Street. Yeah. Darcy, um, I always talk about that. Like, what are those parking spaces? They're, they're so underutilized. They um, are. Yeah. yeah, I, I'm glad you said that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I hope you saw my little celebration dance. <laughs> I wondered. <laughs> so can I wave a magic wand? Oh, yes. I was going to say, Jennifer, you're kind of like the I'm the only person. The one person who is going to give us all the ideas. So yes, wave your magic wand. Tell us. So I'd wave the magic wand and I'd fix all the sidewalks in the center so that there's no mobility issues with, uh, <laughs> with those damn bricks. <laughs> yes, I was going to mention that. <laughs> it's underway. Um, yeah. I, know. So, I know. Yeah, it's, it's a pain in the neck right now, but it is underway, but only up to Pleasant Street. Um, and then we'll see where we can get with the next se segment, but I am happy that it's happening now. Right. Is, is the town hall area being fixed? I know that was, because that's a mess and it's just such a, you know, I mean, how people need to act, everybody, the entire town needs access to town hall in theory, right? And yeah. As well. There's a, there is a proposal out to fix it. And I believe I might be wrong about this, but I believe there's CPA funds available for that right now, or they were planning to apply for CPA funds. But I, I actually saw like the um, like the bid um, meeting advertised today. So there, but there's a lot of pieces to town hall. There's the garden, there's mm -hmm. the sidewalks on Mass Ave, there's the you know back area which is connected to the garden and that's a historical you know Olmsted brothers design mm -hmm. thing so everything takes a long time but yes there is a plan for that because too many people hurt themselves on those bricks yeah. yeah um i would probably say that i don't know that i would raise a magic wand and who knows what's going to happen at this point with uber and lyft but there are just not enough spaces that are um, drop-off pickup spaces for people mm -hmm. or, or, you know, mm -hmm. we're, we're kind of temporarily putting in delivery pickup spaces for the restaurants at the moment because of COVID. But in general, Uber and Lyft just like stop in the middle of traffic, which annoys everybody and is unsafe. And the person who gets out of it or gets into it is unsafe. So I kind of feel like I don't really want to give up parking spaces, but maybe we should be giving up parking spaces to be specifically, you know, where someone pulls into the curb out of the line of traffic, out of the bikes, out of the everything and drops someone off or picks them up. If we're expecting that to grow as a, as a way of getting around, which we were until COVID. So now I don't, I don't know how to predict that, but I do think we're missing that. We only have like one loading zone in town and that was a big, <laughs> took so long for Allie to do all of the negotiating with all of the involved parties with that. Was but one loading zone in the entire town? 
Where is it? In the center, presumably? It's on Alton Street in the center, that, that okay. first block of Alton, Alton adjacent oh. to um, Broadway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. That, but that's it, which I, plenty of places have deliveries mm -hmm. happening, you know. Oh, yeah. I, it just, it's very, I don't know if the businesses complain about it, but I would if I were them. Yeah. Well, the, the people who probably are getting the brunt are cyclists because your deliveries are double parked. Well, if it's on Mass Ave in East Arlington, deliveries yep. are the, the trucks and vans double parked in the bike lane. So yep. that's <laughs> and the same for people, Uber and Lyft, I know have been a problem. Yeah, no, for sure, and Uber and Lyft, that's right. Everywhere, so. Um, so, uh, Jennifer, you mentioned sidewalks. Anything else? I'm sure, actually, we could transition to the next one. I have a feeling. Sure, I have what another idea. <laughs> What's standing in the way? So, so one, one thing I've always wondered about is that we added all this striping for um, the parking spaces, and at the same time, we bought a Mini Cooper <laughs> and we put it in these like separate areas and and it's like there's so much extra space. So when people complain about parking being lost from these various things, you know, were we to not stripe those things, we'd have more parking uh, potentially. Of course, that would mean if we were to add um, meters we'd have to add those boxes which are a little bit more annoying i get that you know in east arlington for example if we were to add meters there we'd have to add a box but it was just also an accessibility issue honestly yeah. to walk to the end of the block and back and yeah. the curb cut and so forth but uh that makes sense yeah i'm writing it down and, yeah. and during the mass of corridor planning 10 years ago there were some complaints a little bit from businesses who made the case that you know right now with it with unmarked parking we can squeeze like seven or eight spaces in, in our block. Right. We have to be yep. marked out 22 feet. With, with, um, there's no meter, but 22 feet. And there's a handicap spot or whatever. So the seven or eight spaces are now five or six. And I know right. that. We lost a lot in East Arlington as a result of, yeah. of making it, you know, up to code with yeah. enough space from the corners and yeah. the minimum what, space. And yeah. The offsets from the crosswalks are really important too. Yeah. Right. Okay, well, I know that Daniel is going to be shutting us down in a few minutes. Uh, Jennifer, it's nice to get a second tour of your new place. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, my, my family is downstairs about to eat dinner, and I realize I can't be down there. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> that sounds good. Okay. Um, so, uh, Darcy, are you kind of ready with some notes to give a little 30 to 60 second? I, I'm kind of looking at them, and I'm just yeah. thinking, okay. do we need to... Standing in the way of making changes sounded to me like people were basically saying it was budget is a huge one. Like we change all the brick sidewalks tomorrow if we could. You know, that's already sort of been agreed about. It's just getting yeah. it done. More bike racks sounded like it was a budget thing. So I think budget no, I think, is huge. Cheap. The bike racks feel cheap to me. I don't, I think that's a logistical, like people just haven't done it. Three or four hundred dollars each. Yeah, 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 they're not much. It's it's a little bit of a storage issue, but I think you're, we could do better. We could do better with that. And and I'll throw some words in Jennifer's mouth, perhaps, and standing in the way. I think probably MBTA is kind of a oh yeah critical, <laughs> critical roadblock for us to sort of solve some of our transit related issues. Yeah, well, what people were saying about the buses and the kids, they're absolutely right. Yeah, you know the seventy seven is so overused by. Yeah, just everybody. Okay. And it the doesn't students. pick up kids if it's full. It just stops, just goes on. Yeah. 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 Lots of frustrated kids. All right, well, um, I'm getting a message. I don't know if others that we're going to be closed down in 25 seconds. So I'm just going to leave right now and go back and see okay. you in the larger group. Thank okay. You. Okay, so um, thank you, everyone. I'm glad so many people were participating. Um, think so I'm going to go to the note takers to or this is the let me just go to the segment where you do a report out and discussion um, so I'm just going to go from the top of the list that I have here um, Darcy do you mind taking a couple minutes to report out from the group that you are in
we we can't hear her. She's yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, you're muted again. Okay. How's that? Better. Sorry. I got automatically muted when I got back in, I guess. Um, we had two bike people, so we spent a lot of time talking about bike infrastructure um, and things like uh, the bike rack program that was done a couple of years ago, where 50 odd bike racks were put in, but then there isn't one in front of the post offices um, or some easy to do places. Um, so that was, that was um, huge for bikes. And uh, we talked about the Minuteman path and how the AHS, the new high school building, is supposed to have that access to the Minuteman, which would take some of the pressure off the, you know, more people would be able to bike and walk to school, except then that got cut as a matter of budget. So mm -hmm. if that's really important to people, that needs to get added back in. Um, so that was one of the budget things. The other budget thing was that was huge is fixing the brick sidewalks everywhere. Everybody agrees that we should do it, basically. I think even the historical people have given in on that one. But we don't have enough money to do it. And in the meantime, it's hard for the pedestrians, really hard for um, disabled people. It's, it, it would be a magic wand. It would be great. Um, I think uh, for bike racks, we could try movable or temporary ones. Um, and put them in spaces like right in front of a post and see how that goes and ask people and then maybe we could move it to somewhere else instead of trying to pick spaces and put them down in advance. Uh, and it, the MBTA and the buses, absolutely, we all agree. We, we need better service. Our 77 is completely oversubscribed. Um, and there's the timing issues that people mention in pretty much every conversation. Uh, and then there was a little note about, oh, <laughs> that the parking spaces get striped, which is great, except then you can fit fewer cars. And um, like a Mini Cooper, you could be getting a lot more stuff in there, but now you can't because they're striped. But they're, I'm not sure there's anything we can do about that. They're striped according to code, sort of. So, um, but it was just a thing. And, oh, drop off pickup spots and loading zones aren't, don't seem to be in the plan at all at the moment. Um, and they really should be because there's the Uber and Lyft. There's the whole issue of delivery trucks double parking, which is really hard for the bicyclists uh, on Mass Ave to keep, you know, to kind of get around that. Um, so maybe we could have more loading zones or more drop off pickup people zones. And I think that was it. It wasn't very organized, but that was it. <laughs> Thank you, Darcy. Thank you very much. I'm uh, going to go to Jenny. Sure, no problem. Um, all right. So I was with Len and a nice group who had a, uh, we mostly talked about questions one and two. So just quickly, um, I think most people for question one felt that um, the priorities were very reflective of Arlington, that um, you know, and also of the people participating. Um, that, for example, um, folks uh, suggested that they um, they might have biked in the past a little bit more, but now they walk. And that uh, a lot of the people participating in the conversation were very focused on uh, being walk friendly, and also though questioning what is what exactly that might mean in Arlington, which seems to mean a number of different things depending upon where you're walking, of course. Um, like, for example. It could mean um, in front of town hall that we need to think about more, you know, level surfaces and removing some barriers. Um, it could also mean uh, for street crossings, improving those crossings. Um, and then, uh, you know, also a focus on transit, uh, that that is also something that people uh, in that group uh, felt was also something to think about and reflect upon. Um, another person brought up, or actually one person said that, um, they were glad to see that uh, people were thinking more broadly beyond the automobile uh, and people are thinking uh, in the sort of a holistic manner at the whole system and not just focused on one thing, which was positive. Um, another person brought up the issue of thinking about how climate change and mitigation and sort of the bad winter storm that we had five years ago, what lessons we may learn from those types of things and also plan for in the future in relationship to this issue of walk friendly. 
um, as well as, of course, many other things. Um, and then also just the issue of equity and diversity, what might be missing. So we talked a little bit about that as well, um, including thinking about children a little bit more, especially since we heard some of that raised in the earlier Q&A. Um, and then for the second waving of the wand, um, uh, a we spent some time talking just about changing behavior and how challenging that is for people in various modes, whether it's uh, drivers, people on bikes, and even walkers, um, pedestrians not always paying attention to the rules and also just sharing uh, sometimes limited uh, spaces. Um, so that was one. The other thing we talked about was just sort of, you know, the pre-COVID, although hopefully a post-COVID dream of a 21st century transportation, uh, transit system rather, that that would be the real true alternative to driving and uh, that we should still continue to think about that, but it might look a little bit different. And then also about some you know, quicker fixes that could ease and sort of disincentivize some of the bad behavior. Um, chicanes were, were mentioned, there might be other things as well to think about. And also beyond Arlington, sort of thinking about like regional transportation um, or regional transit, like faster rail for easy on, easy off, maybe even autonomous vehicles. So looking at that big picture that also will help Arlington. And then standing in the way, we just had a couple things. One is just learning about information to resources. A lot of people have great ideas to share, but they don't know where to, where to, how to raise them up the flagpole. And um, also just comments about the MBTA. <laughs> I won't go, I won't, I won't, uh, nobody's from the MBTA in this group, but um, <laughs> I think we have, I think we'll be talking to the MBTA because there are many things that, um, of course, people in Arlington feel very strongly about the efficiency of what we get and why some things don't always work as well as they could. And that will become more important in the future as well. Thanks, Dan. And thanks to the group and Len. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, moving on to Julie. Okay, so uh, the group generally felt like the, um, they agreed with the goals, though there was definitely an interest in um, uh, more emphasis on biking. Um, we did talk about the fact that there was quite uh, an overlap between a lot of the goals, however, um, and people did also want to reemphasize being concerned about um, safety for, uh, especially for our pedestrian environment. Um, Carol pointed out that if people didn't feel safe, then we wouldn't get them out of their cars. I thought that was a great point. Um, the, so the second question, uh, we talked a lot about um, tr how to um, get people out of their cars, get people walking. And so um, people talked about uh, trying to address our sidewalks. Um, that was brought up a couple of times, um, wanting to, again, make them safer. Uh, and then also, um, Matt was feeling like there is some disorganization around the setup of our streets in town. Uh, you know, feeling like sometimes there are driveways coming into pretty main roadways and that can be a challenge for um, the, for the actual um, transportation. Um, and then we talked about, um, oh, what was standing in the way of making change? So um, there was a little bit of talk about um, wanting to try and uh, remind people about all of the positive health, health outcomes that you can get out of getting out of your car. Um, a couple of people talked about that and trying to sort of change behavior through that positive thinking. Um, uh, but then really, you know, things like what would stand, what may be standing in the way of making these cha this change, um, money and space being issues, you know, obviously um, these being, hurdles to making you know our sidewalks better or increasing bus lanes um and let's see oh we talked about make driving less convenient and mass transit more convenient um and really thinking about some more of those um priority bus lanes uh rather than letting people just park and sit their car all there all day long really trying to use some of our our parking lanes as as bus lanes um and then Finally, the magic wand conversation we talked about putting in priority signals and lanes for buses would be a good start. Um, upgrading mass transit and, you know, same, same theme, pressuring the MBTA, you know, really getting on schedule and actually caring if you're doing it or not doing it. Um, and, and 
again, that bus rapid transit. Um, so I definitely saw some, uh, some mass transit and safety sidewalks um, and bicycling themes. Thank you, Julie. Um, I'll go to Kelly. Hi, I was with Heather Barber's group. Um, we had a nice smaller group of people who actually use a lot of different modes to get around. Um, and so in looking at the goals, I think everyone really agreed with the goals. They didn't really have a problem with that, although they did see that there was a lot of overlap and some similarity between some of them. And they would like to see the, the number six and seven ranked goals, um, the number six expanding, um, dealing with expanded bicycle facilities and number seven about getting a little bit more into like the sustainability and environmental focus of the plan um, as elevating those so that they don't get lost um, behind the top five goals and then um, around the magic wave the magic wand discussion we um, waving a magic wand um, trying to find a balance between wishing we had sidewalks everywhere that were in really good conditions um, thinking about how people using more environmentally friendly automobiles, not necessarily eliminating all cars, but thinking about how can we encourage people to use um, more sustainable forms of, of getting around. And then better connections for commuters to the 128 corridor um, and finding more zip car locations, thinking about ride hailing services um, where you have a fixed route, but people can sort of hail a ride along that route. Um, in general, thinking about um, how can we encourage people to go car light or, you know, going from two cars down to one car. Um, we didn't have a lot of time to focus on the third question, um, but in general, we started by talking about the hills and you can't flatten them <laughs> and um, our topography is a challenge and then um, money. You know, we have no lack of ambition for great projects, um, but things go very slowly because of the cost. So that's it. Thank you, Kelly. And I think the last person is Steve. Hello. Yes, I was uh, with Rachel's group and I, I should, um, I'd like to say that Rachel did a very nice job of, you know, getting to everyone and getting through all of, uh, all of the questions. So, um, I will make my report. So in the first question, uh, so there was a desire to see cycling given a more prominent position in the survey. And this in would include cyclists who travel through Arlington, but don't necessarily begin and end trips here. Um, you know, safety, every, there was agreement that safety was important, that all of the top priorities were important. Um, you know, there was discussion about the trade-offs between the space trade-offs that you have to make for a multimodal street, allowing room for cyclists, room for drivers, uh, and that sort of thing. But, you know, there was, I think there was general agreement about uh, the importance of safety. For the magic wand, we totally went all out. So magic wand number one was a red line running down one side of Arlington and a green line running downside the other. Uh, getting rid of cars as much as possible, especially on secondary neighborhood roads. ADA compliant flyovers on the bike path so that uh, someone on the bike path, whether they were walking or cycling, would not have to navigate traffic, basically eliminate street crossings when you're on the bikeway. Uh, a tunnel so that one, instead of having to ride up and down Park Avenue, you could ride through it. And um, see, and just having a consistent cross section of Mass Ave that allowed for cycling lanes, maybe a little narrower amount of space for cars, wider sidewalks, and more room for, you know, outdoor activity, and of course, better service on the MBTA buses. So in things that stand in the way of these goals, uh, money um, was, was one. Our car-centric culture was also seen as a, as a challenge. And, you know, basically that boils down to getting people to drive even when, you know, there are other modes of transportation uh, they can use. Um, so, you know, let's see. We have a diverse set of needs for transportation. Some of these are at odds with each other and sometimes that's, that's an impediment to moving forward. Um, having transit innovations that could serve different groups without inconveniencing um, two or more groups would be useful. Um, and also, it w we noted that 
you know, different areas of our transit system are funded by different authorities and under different, the jurisdiction of different groups. And sometimes those groups don't always talk to each other and, and coordinate well. And perhaps that is something that could be uh, improved. Um, yeah, and finally, maybe maybe one maybe after the health emergency is over, more people will work from home and there will be less traffic on the roads. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, I had never heard a tunnel through Park Avenue before. That's a new one for me. That's an uh, amazing magic wand. I want some of that magic <laughs> wand. That, that was that's great. I love it. Um, well, we have about four minutes, four or five minutes, if um, anyone wants to have further discussion about the questions from the breakout groups or any thoughts or reactions from what was shared from the breakout groups. I'll just leave it open for a moment. Um, if anyone wants to raise their hand. If not, I can go to the end. Okay. So I just want to thank everyone for attending and for coming, all the participants that came and stayed for the breakout groups. This was really great feedback that we received. I do want to thank all of the committee members. Um, especially that were facilitators or note takers, staff that um, helped to make this happen and were note takers and helped with all of the coordination around the Zoom meetings and forum. Um, doing everything by technology doesn't seem to make things easier all the time, in my opinion. Um, the fact book, as I mentioned, I hope we will be able to reset, release that in the next couple of weeks. Uh, waiting for uh, some more edits to come back to have that ready for public release. Um, you know, the next phase of the project getting to the vision for the transportation system, which is, this is all extremely helpful for that. Um, and over the next couple of weeks, um, there'll be a form that we'll put onto the website where um, we'll have the recording of this uh, up, I think early next week. And people will be able to watch this or also look at the uh, additional slides that have additional information and um, respond to um, you know, a Google form about the, um, about the uh, goals that we talked about in uh, this discussion here and also some of the other questions that we had during, during the breakout groups. So uh, the next uh, big engagement opportunities we expect to uh, be more in the fall, uh, I think towards the September, October timeframe. Is there, Jenny, anything else you want to say at the end here? No, just a thank you, Dan, for all your work organizing this this evening. So I think with that, I'll thank you. <laughs> and I'll unmute and give you a nice hand. <laughs> we don't get to we don't get to do that in the auditorium, but if we could, this is what we would do. <laughs> Excellent work. And so I'll mute, uh, I'll, I'll mute everyone so I can hear them. <laughs> uh, and ACMI is recording tonight, so. Um, thanks to ACMI, as always. Um, we appreciate your, we appreciate you and thank you for sharing this video after it's over. And we look forward to more participation um, to come. All right. I think that's all. Thank you. Thanks, Good night, everybody. everyone. <laughs>